It's World War II. L.A. booms with production enabled by the Port of Los Angeles. One third of all ships and warplanes are made here. In just 10 years, this economic injection will prop up L.A. into an industrial, financial, and sprawling powerhouse. Today, the Port of Los Angeles, in combination with the Port of Long Beach, move the most cargo in the Western Hemisphere. It's also nowhere near L.A. Picture the shape of Los Angeles in your head. You probably can't, and there's a reason for that. It has a very unmerchandisable, unfriendly shape. And the reason that is, is because of the Port of Los Angeles. Los Angeles, the city center, is nowhere near Los Angeles, the port. But there's a really small five mile strip neighborhood that is only a block wide that makes the shape of LA look like it's hooked to a catheter bag. This is called Harbor Gateway. As I am speaking the sentence, we will have already entered and exited Los Angeles. This side of the street is Los Angeles. This side of the street is Gardena. All the street signs on the left are blue. All the street signs on the right are green. The majority of the neighborhood for this three mile stretch is the 110 freeway that is the neighborhood basically. The longest you can drive through the neighborhood is the 110 because there's no other road that goes directly through. So why does LA have this wonky ass neighborhood connecting the port of LA? Well, it's because Angelinos love the ocean and its salt air and its beautiful views and just any extra shoreline adds so much to the city. Sorry, I was just handed a card from my producer. Like the majority of motivations in life, it's money. LA wants to own and control half of the nation's largest harbor complex because they can tax all imports and exports at a hefty profit of $300 million a year. So the other thing it connects is the neighborhood of Wilmington. And the reason they want Wilmington is still a giant oil reserve and they want money from that oil. This type of system for connecting two places with a thin strip is called a shoestring annex. So actually, a lot of cities do this. Your city might actually do this. Just two examples. Chicago with O'Hare Airport and San Diego with the international border. So because of Harbor Gateway's lanky shape, there's three weird neighborhood attributes. One, highest amount of liquor stores per capita. Two, because there's a lack of parks, this area used to have the highest concentration of sex offenders who realized they could move in the neighborhood because of that loophole. But when LA realized this, they built some quick, cheap parks to kick them out. And then three, there's nothing interesting we can film here. So it's mostly uh, me talking to you guys while driving. If you live in the city of Los Angeles, Yesterday, on your work commute, you probably drove by a relic of World War II and the Cold War and had no idea. These are old air raid sirens that were put up after the attack on Pearl Harbor to hypothetically warn of a similar attack on Los Angeles. And today, over 200 of them still loom over the city. And for some reason, one at LA Live is a flower. And once you see one, you'll start to notice them everywhere. It's like a weird geriatric version of Where's Waldo? If Waldo was also a harbinger of death, which different conversation, there's some compelling stuff online. But if you want to see the coolest thing from this era and you can climb, while maybe inadvertently showing off your white privilege, there's the Terminal Island Shipyard. Built during the war, it was places like this and other wartime production plants that brought swarms of new citizens to LA and led to a wartime boom. This is a big complex where over 15,000 people worked where they repaired warships damaged in battle. And I bet you with my life in 10 years, it's going to be turned into like a swanky food hall and microbreweries. Cause that always seems to be the timeline for anything old and cool in this city. And also, if you are like me, it's a great place to try to get acquainted, but maybe slightly annoy 
the wildlife. Wherever you're watching this right now, we're connected by concrete. But only less than a lifetime ago, we weren't. When World War II ended, LA had grown a bigger population than 37 states. LA spreads and gets wide, really wide. It's the poster child for urban sprawl. And from beaches, along mountains, through hills, all the way to the desert, we were all soon connected by that gray lifeblood. But there's a lost world within LA of novel experiments for people's brand new reliance on their cars. LA is synonymous with the car. The road shaped the entire place. The only other city with a comparable interbred relationship is Venice in the sea. And there's one Southern California road in particular that starts off freeway expansion, not just here, but in the entire United States. Oh boy, here we go. Right now I'm on the Arroyo Seco, which was the first freeway in the United States. And crazy thing about this freeway, the infrastructure of the freeway has basically not changed since opening day. Technically, Pennsylvania Turnpike opened up a month before, but we're talking about freeways here. And uh, free is in the word freeway. Turnpike, you gotta like pay for that. So it's obviously not free. It is always a frightening drive. Like I gotta look out for that mother right there because the entrances and exits have no leeway. There's no room to accelerate. You just go onto a freeway where cars are rushing by you at 70 miles an hour and you're supposed to be able to accelerate when there's no merge room. So no joke, since I filmed this segment on this freeway I got in a small fender bender coming back from Trader Joe's. When this was built, no one had actually designed a freeway before. And maybe if they'd like actually sat down for a minute and really thought about it, they would have realized that the majority of their plan was there's also no merge room for the exits. The exits just suddenly stop, and it is a horrible drive. All the curves are too tight. They're not banked. It just doesn't stop curving. There was nothing here, like they could have gone straight. This is how I get to Trader Joe's weekly, and it is never not frightening going to Trader Joe's. I decided to film this segment hungover. That was a terrible idea and not having a uh, correct tripod for my uh, cell phone, which keeps on falling over. You know, my, Jesus Christ, frightening it is. Jesus Christ. Ah! But even though this freeway sucks, it was a civil engineering landmark and the watershed for every freeway you use. Even if it's a prime prototype for everything you shouldn't do designing a freeway. Also, I think it's cool just because it's the main plot point in the film Who Frame Roger Rabbit. The Arroyo Seco Parkway solidifies LA's future as the world's first major city dictated by the car. Motor-capable streets will shape neighborhoods and entire cities. And then the car becomes something beyond just transportation. It seeps into one's recreation, social life, and personality. Eventually, one-third of all land in Los Angeles will be paved. The halcyon era of early cars' novel and exciting potential have passed, but the Southland is still dotted with enduring shrines to those early budding days. Out in the Inland Empire is the Wigwam Motel, a super cool late stop on the famous Route 66. There's only three of these classic motels left in the country, and I'm betting the world. You can also do it in a teepee. Wink, wink you can have sex in a teepee. Drive to La Puente, and you can get your sugar rush at the donut hole. It's a giant drive-through donut and donut shop. 
do I have to sell this any more than this? Hey, how's it going? You have a raspberry jam filled donut, please. Do the fumes ever go in there? No. Okay, that's nice. That's good. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you have a good day. Yeah, it's definitely not the quality. <laughs> it's fine. Just five suburban blocks north from there is an LA first that I bet the majority of you watching this have lazily visited in the last week. I definitely have. In and Out Burger in Baldwin Park was the very first drive through in the world. That is it. What else do you want from me? <laughs> This is only like 70 years old, but in like a thousand years, it's going to be like the new Parthenon. I'm sure there was car accidents. I'm sure people just parked right there and just like left to try to order a burger. Before this, you had car hop service where you would drive into a place and like a girl would come out on roller skates and they'd put a metal tray on your car and put the food there. And because it was like the 50s, all the teens were like drinking and smoking. This small building took an entire basically car hop. Everyone knows what a drive through is. Why am I explaining this? The automobile also influenced the housing architecture of the time. This is a dingbat apartment. Designed modern to show off your car with tuck under parking. As you can see, some have subsequently had garage doors added to them. Dingbats are most common along the Sun Belt, but the epicenter of them in the world is Los Angeles. People don't like them. They're seen as cheap and soul crushing, but when they've been refurbished right, I think they're pretty cool and like kind of chic and modern. Hey. <laughs> hey, how you doing? Big car culture at that time. Hot rods and cars were a big part of our identity in those days. But it was kind of a case where if you had a car, you were free to do what you wanted to do. If you didn't have a car, you had to beg and borrow and steal whatever you could get to get some transportation. And still spread throughout Southern California from this heyday are drive-in movie theaters though the majority of them today also operate as swap meets. I mean, the drive-in was a social event. If you took a girl to drive-in, that was a big deal. Like, why was it a big deal to take a girl to the drive-in in that day? Well, because you could make out. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was the easiest place to, to do that? <laughs> yeah, because you gotta realize that before that was only inside movie theaters. Put your arm around a girl, everybody in the theater knew you what you were doing. Well, if you took them in a car, you could put your arm around it and peep, the windows would fog out and they couldn't see in anyway. It's amazing. It allowed you to have independence and some freedom to do what you wanted to do. Driving a movie was risque in some ways and freedom in other ways. So it could be anything you wanted it to be. So also something from this era that is still around and still very cool, but there's not a lot of them left, is the drive-in market. I don't know how this is legal. <laughs> but I love it. Okay. Hey, does anyone want anything? I remember always being in my sister's car with her going to the dairy. They predated the 7-Elevens and the Circle Ks, except you literally drove into them, you rolled down their window, and you told them what you wanted, and they rang it up for you. I'm gonna grab an Airhead. I love Airheads. I will grab some Takis. Uh, Russ, this what you wanted? So my oldest sister had a cerebral palsy. She was born with a, a, you know, basically that's a birth defect. She had kids, she drives, she had a pretty normal life, but it's really a pain in the ass for her to get out of her car. And so this was like a godsend for my sister because she could just do most of her grocery shopping by just driving into the dairy and getting her things she needs. So when those dairies went away, it was kind of a bummer for her. Have you ever had anyone like drive into any of the stuff before? No, never. It's been good. So far, it's been good. Uh, not the wood. Knock on wood. Hey. Thank you so Thank much. You, sir, you have a good day. Oh, you want to get me driving out? Cool. Sure. Let's do it. Thanks. Some people say LA feels impersonal or not like a real city because of the reliance of the car. But is Venice less charming because of its inconvenient boats? Or is San Francisco more impersonal because of its steep, inconvenient hills? Just because the geography of your identity is a little askew doesn't make it inferior. And once you embrace it, you define your own set of pleasures within it. So right now, 
just thinking on the spot. Describe your perfect vacation. Is there an ocean? Did you think palm trees? Of course you did. And there's a whole movement from LA that implanted that vision in your brain. So right now we're in Hollywood. We're literally a block from Hollywood and Highland. And this street corner doesn't look notable because there's a really tacky apartment across the street. But what is actually notable about this street corner is in 1933, this is where the very first Tiki restaurant opened up. It was called Don the Beachcomber. This is where tiki culture was invented. As you can see, the restaurant is no longer there, but it's been wonderfully commemorated by these three palm trees. You have restaurants invent a food, and then that food becomes big and then spreads everywhere else. What this restaurant did, though, was start an entire cultural phenomenon. Prohibition had just ended. America was still in the depths of the Depression. Travel at this time was basically only for rich people and celebrities. And an ideal exotic getaway was something that could now be lived vicariously through a restaurant. So the restaurant it starts right here and it kind of infiltrates everything. There's a big craze about it. And like by the mid 50s, it's in um, the media, movies. It birthed the popularity of the rum cocktail, which is still going strong and I drink a lot of. This is where they say the Mai Tai was invented, but every tiki restaurant in existence also claims it invented the Mai Tai. So I don't know uh, if you can believe that. There's also Polynesian inspired hotels, motels, restaurants, apartment complexes. There's drive-in theaters, tiki porno theaters. The tiki craze literally both invaded Disneyland and Disney World. Musical artists made Hawaiian albums. Marty Robbins has a Hawaiian album. Elvis had a Hawaiian album. And Southern California is still a haven for tiki culture. Around the entire soft land, there is still apartments and bars and stuff that are all left over from the movement. You have a lot of styles kind of come and go, and it's been a weirdly persistent style. I was just in Long Beach uh, before coronavirus and went to a brand new tiki bar, went to one in San Diego. It's still, it's still a very prominent thing. And it all started uh, from this street corner in the 30s. If somebody asked you to describe California's architecture, could you? What would you say? Since its founding, California has always had highly thematic architecture. Like if you watched the previous episode of the show and you retained stuff, CA's first architecture, Mission Revival, was a romantic lens on Spanish California. And that idea of taking everyday places and making them fantastical has literally carried all the way to today and is still thriving. Look at the Americana. But I feel like there's a point in 1955 where novel architecture hits its apex. Disneyland. Everybody knows Disney. We're not going to talk about it. But in Southern California, because of Disney, there's a weird side effect, which is the pseudo Disneyland ripoff. And there's a ton of them. First, literally across the street from the theme park are multiple hotels and motels that unabashedly cop Fantasyland's aesthetic to try and land visiting guests lodging accommodations. Five miles southwest of Disneyland is another Fantasyland resemblance. Old World Village in Huntington Beach is a Euro-themed shopping center that has a hotel, market, chapel, and bar, and some midsummer looking It was designed so its shopkeepers could live above their businesses and according to a 1989 LA Times article, 40 families lived in the mall. Exiting Old World, take one left and you can follow Beach Boulevard all the way back to Anaheim where you'll come across the remnants of Hobby City. Opening the same year as Disneyland, back in the day, each building here was dedicated to a different hobby. But as you can see, it has Frontier and Fantasyland vibes. So keep going up Beach Boulevard two more miles, and across the street from Knott's Berry Farm is a brick-by-brick brick replica of Independence Hall in Philadelphia. Now, you might be saying, how is this a Disneyland ripoff? Well, did you know Walt Disney originally planned a colonial-themed land east of Main Street? 
Look, if you think this is a stretch, I'm going to pull the, I was previously a Disney cast member card and like, I still use the Disney point. It's better than regular pointing, look it up. Up in San Gabriel is this main street looking strip mall that I can't find any info on. I have I, I, no story, n nothing. Also in San Gabriel, it's Clearman's Northwoods Inn. Opened in 1958, three years after Disney, has a clear fantasy land incentive on this one. Uh, short story, when I was a kid and like uh, dumb, when I would drive by this on the five freeway, I assumed it was associated with Disneyland. So clearly working. If you want to see a very similar feeling facsimile on a much larger scale, head up to the San Bernardino Mountains to see the leftovers of Santa's Village Amusement Park, which was a theme park for children that just got turned into a mountain biking park. Sometimes capitalism just works. So Santa's Village actually opened up a month and a half before Disneyland, but like, come on. So how could one rip off a park not built yet? Well, a year and a half before Disneyland opened, Walt Disney broadcasted all of the park's plans on ABC to help secure more funding for the park. So the next ripoff was actually more of a trend. Following the opening of New Orleans Square, Crescent City-inspired architecture popped up around SoCal that seems to be mostly centered in Glendale and Santa Ana. My fave of these is what I call Big Easy Ralphs in Glendale. Also, another building I can't find any info on like why the hell. Another mimicry where you would least expect one is in the very center of downtown, St. Vincent Court. This Main Street-like copy, or like crappy Epcot on acid, was decorated like this in 1957, two years after Disney, to clearly gleam some of that fantastical Euro popularity that was going around. In closing us out, a straight shot down the 110 is Alpine Village in Torrance. It's got a market, had an awesome restaurant, RIP, small shops, and a cool chapel. The founder says it was inspired by his German cultural heritage, but I say that's him trying to emotionally manipulate us into not recognizing fantasy lands. So on face value, this can be taken as kitsch, but as a whole, something runs deeper, embedded in the DNA of all Angelinos. Angelinos, as a people, are world-class proprietors of media, fantasy, and creating worlds, and that's what I see here. It's a reflection of us and the ambitions that brought us all out here. And whether it's an apartment complex or a gun shop, why not give the mundanity of day-to-day -day living some vision? It reminds me of a quote from the great Francis Ford Coppola that I think about from time to time. It takes no imagination to live within your means. And I appreciate all the visionaries who tried to apply that here. They collectively and accidentally created a city that looks like every other but like no other.